Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, it's an honor to be with you. I love your church. I love your leaders. Um, and I, it's fun because I, I know many of those that are connected here in, wor- in the worship reality from my relationships with IHOP Kansas City. Uh, as Pastor Lee said, I, I lead a uh, house of prayer in Atlanta, Georgia, that in the last three years we've merged with a local church and uh, we're, we're quite the aardvark of a ministry. You can't quite tell what we are. But we're something that God has been dreaming about for a long time. And, and I believe it's, it's this idea that he wants to take the person and presence of Jesus and put it right center place in his church again. He wants to repossess his church. And so, um, but he's not going to do it apart from the church. He's going to do it in the church. And, and the person of Jesus will be this, the centerpiece. And worship and adoration to, his, to him and to his name will be the centerpiece. And so that's something he's doing all over the earth. I believe that what you all have here is one expression of that, one uh, powerful expression of what it looks like when a people will say, you know what, we're not going to do all the church trappings. I mean, we'll do it. We'll do what we do excellently. But what we're going to do is we're going to put worship and prayer right at the center. Hey, Jeff, (laughs) how are you, man? I love you. Um, sorry, we hadn't seen each other in a while. <laughs> um, but what happens when you put Jesus, the person of Jesus and adoration to his name right at the center. And, uh, I think, I don't think I know he's going to do this all over the earth. And this is one example of it. So I, I'm just so honored to be here. Your hospitality is off the charts. Uh, many of you are fasting, but I just don't tell you this. Uh, I got in my room last night. There was an entire cooler worth of food in my, in my hotel room. And I, was, I looked at it. I go, oh, I just need to be cool with this. I need to not do this. And I looked, and there was these chocolate-covered cherries. Y'all are famous for cherries around this part, these parts? Uh, I'll just eat one. The whole bag was gone in about 15 minutes. I ate an entire bag of chocolate-covered cherries. I ate them in the name of the Lord last night. That was my sacrifice unto God. <laughs> to buffet myself before him. Anyway, um, well, it's an honor, honor to be here. Uh, I've been married 28 years. I have four kids. And I just, anyway, my wife, my family, they're honored to send me and they greet you. So let's pray and we'll get into the word for the next few minutes. Thank you, Lord. Lord, thank you for your presence. Thank you for what you're doing here. Thank you that your eye is on the righteous, and your ear is attentive to our prayer. You care about us. You love us. And you're closer than the breath we breathe. You're closer than the air we breathe. Thank you for being that intimate with us. We set our face towards you, Jesus, you who have the eyes of fire, you whose face shines like the sun in its strength, you whose voice is like the sound of many waters. You're the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. You're he who is dead and you're alive forevermore. You have the keys of death, hell, and the grave. And you hold the seven stars in your hands. You walk among the lampstands. So Lord, just take the next few moments we have together. And I pray you'd use whatever I, whatever I bring, whatever I offer, use it for your glory, for your exaltation. And I just, I just pray in this season of seeking that radiant is, is going after right now that you would so meet them in their seeking. So even tonight, use my weak words, spark hearts to pursue you with a greater abandonment. We give you thanks. And everybody that agreed with that said amen. Well, turn with me, uh, if you will, if you have a Bible or a device. I want your eyes to look at these words. I'm sure they'll put them up on the screen. But Isaiah 57. Let's look at that. I... um, 
think it's fantastic that I get to be here at this most unusual season. Um, 2020, I think we crossed a line. And uh, I think the new normal is nothing's going to be normal. Um, you know, uh, a friend of mine had a dream um, the day after Christmas. And in the dream, there was a fire sale. And everybody was selling all these signs. And all the signs were comforts that they were getting ready to uh, get back into in 2021. But they were, they were selling all the signs off because those comforts weren't going to comfort anybody in 2021. And the one that they were running past was a sign that said, the beauty and the glory of the bride. And the point of the dream was that the Lord was sovereignly directing human affairs to bring about a beautiful and spotless bride. And where everyone was running to earthly comforts that were supposed to, you know, get us back to normal, get us back to flowing the way we're used to, all that was not going to be worth anything. The only thing that was going to be worth anything was becoming that pure and spotless bride that Jesus is directing the course of human affairs. He's bringing us to that place where we're going to look just like him. We're going to sound just like him. We're going to think just like him. I just, I just want you to get this. We are on a collision course with a wedding. We're on our way to a wedding. And I like to say it this way. If you're not at a, at a wedding, the story's not over. You know, because we can look at current circumstance and we can get really discouraged when we look at what's going on in the earth. But the Lord is not surprised. He's not shocked. He's not concerned or worried in a negative way. He is working everything according to the counsel of his will. That's what Ephesians 1.11 says. Working everything according to the counsel of his will. And he is purifying for himself a people in the earth that he is going to marry. I just, that just blows my mind. We're going to be joined with him forever at the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're on our way to that event. And, and you look around, you go, well, everything is like going crazy. How could we be on our, that's what he's doing. He's shaking everything so that only the stuff that's unshakable remains. Because you and I are part of the unshakable kingdom, aren't we? We're not part of a, we, our citizenship, we may be, you know, United States citizens, but we have a citizenship that's settled in heaven, don't we? We have an unshakable kingdom that we're a part of, and we're on our way to the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's your destiny. To marry deity. And sometimes you just got to go big picture to actually figure out how do I operate right now in the small <laughs> Because if that perspective, if it can govern your trajectory, if you can think, okay, that's where I'm heading. I'm going to a wedding. I'm going to look Jesus in the face. I'm going to marry Jesus. Then you got to realize, well, he's going to take you through a, a, a radical transformation so that you're a comparable bride. And that's what he's doing with me. That's what he's doing with you. That's what he's doing with all of us. And um, my hope is that the events of 2020 would have brought us to our knees, put us on our face. I love what you guys are doing, taking the beginning of this year, fasting, praying, seeking God. But when I look across the landscape, I'm, I, do, I do carry a concern. The Lord's not concerned. I'm burdened because I look at the response of many in the church right now to the events of 2020, whether it's the uh, social unrest, whether it's the virus, whether it's, you know, the political unrest, uh, and the cooperative response doesn't seem to be that we've humbled ourselves. It seems to be that we've emboldened ourselves around things we thought would bring us comfort. And I feel very, very strongly right now that the, the clear word that I have from the Lord is humble yourself. Humble yourself before me. And, and that's what I want to talk about tonight. I want to talk about God's invitation to humility and what he promises. Uh, Isaiah 57, 
he says some, some huge statements uh, in this passage. And uh, I would encourage you to read the whole chapter. In fact, Isaiah 57 and 58, read them together. But verse 15, he says, Thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. That's just such a weighty passage. Look, look, look what he calls himself, the high and lofty one. Look where he lives, who inhabits eternity. Look what his name is, holy. Look where he likes to set down or dwell in the high and holy place. And look who he likes to sit down with. Him was a contrite and humble spirit. And look who he promises revival to. To revive the spirit of the humble. To revive the heart of the contrite ones. Or the, that word contrite is crushed. Crushed ones. When I see this passage, I see what God says about himself. What he says he's into. What he says he wants to do where he says he wants to dwell, it, my, my mind is captivated because I realize there's things moving in his heart. Uh, Ephesians 2.22 is a great passage. He says he wants to build his church together as a dwelling place for God in the Spirit. It's a companion passage with this one. This one he says, I will dwell in the highest place with the lowest people. And um, one thing I am certain of right now is that the church has to get lower. We've got to get lower. I've got to get lower. You've got to get lower. We've all got to get lower. I posted online a couple passages about humility and our need for it right now. And you know, there's no filter online. People say, oh, whatever they want to say. You know, sometimes I think, oh, I'll say that to my face, you know, but they, they won't. But I was blown away because believers were coming at me for me just saying we need to humble ourselves. And I thought, man, 2020... Some of us, it really rattled us. It really brought us low. But some of us, it's almost like it didn't move us at all. It just strengthened us in our partisanship politically. Or it strengthened us in our, you know, natural underpinnings. It didn't actually break our hands off the things we've been holding on to as comforts and crutches. And I'm just convinced of this. He loves us so much. He's so into his church. He, he's working to see his church become just like him. He wants to marry us. He's more committed to us and to our growth than I think we are sometimes. And he will fight for us to the end. And he will fight with us for us. He will even break our hand off of the other lovers. And when I look at 2020, I think, oh my goodness, he started a process of prying our hands off of everything else we've trusted so that we will trust in him and him alone. Amen. There's a passage that the Lord put on my heart in, in like August, September, Jeremiah 17. I'll just, I'll just say briefly what it says. It, it, it's a, a real story you know, strong word. It says, whoever trusts in man will be cursed, but whoever trusts in the Lord will be blessed. He'll be like a tree by streams of water, 
His roots will go deep. It's a companion to Psalm 1. And I thought, man, Lord, are we still trusting in flesh? Are we still trusting in our ways? Are we still trusting in our own emblems? And, and I was just compelled, and I, and I, and I preached that word to, to our, to our uh, spiritual family in Atlanta. And, you know, it's as if the Lord has been inviting us over and over and over again to find our way to his feet, to trust in him and him alone. But I just want to say this real strongly. In his commitment to us, he is going to continue to address everything else that's keeping us from his feet. And you're probably feeling that even right now. You're in a fast. Those of you that are fasting, you know how you, you know, you're, you're week one. What day are you on? What is this? Day seven. It's like, you know, by now you've gotten over the three or four day hump. Because day three, it's like, I will eat a dead animal off the road. But, but day seven, you start finding your groove, but you start seeing your soul. You start trembling on the inside. You start realizing, wow, I, I filled my soul with so many other things. It's just non-essential, not important. And the high and lofty one says, come low. Come low. I want to dwell with you. And that's really what we're after, isn't it? To be a people where God dwells. To be a dwelling place for God. To, to really experience what it means to have his glory in our midst. I'm convinced, the Bible's clear, he is going to bring his church to her face so he can dwell with us. So he can manifest among us. I want to take you to a familiar passage. Second Chronicles 7. Let's just look at it just for a minute. Second Chronicles 7. You know this passage. This is the famous revival passage. I'm convinced we're going to see a massive revival, a mighty revival in America. I'm convinced the church is going to be a ready bride. I'm so, I'm comforted in that. I'm so confident of that. Uh, we might have some turbulence on the way there. Some more turbulence on the way there. But I'm so convinced of this, that we're going to see a, a third great awakening in America. The Lord started whispering this passage to me again around August, September. And it's obviously one of the most familiar revival passages there is. I mean, if you are into revival history or ever been to the revival meeting or whatever, this one always shows up. Second Chronicles 7.14, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin and heal their land. And I think so often that passage is read and we in the church, we read that passage and we go, yeah, they all got to repent. All those sinners out there, the pornographers and the abortionists and all those racists out there somewhere, they all need to repent, all of them. And we pray this passage, we go, they all need to turn from their wicked ways. And then God will heal our land. There's a fatal flaw in that mentality. It's not always them. And that's not who this passage is directed towards. It's us. It's me. Like, it's, it's really me. It's really the leaders. It's really the church. In the first few phrases, that was the one that, that's what the Lord is underlining for me. If my people. And I go, no, I know this passage. If my people will call by my name, hold themselves, pray, wicked ways, you'll heal the land. Heal the land, God. He goes, no, 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 stop. Read the first phrase. If my people. I go, yeah, if my people. Humble themselves, pray, seek your face. I'm after your face. We're doing seek, God. 21 days seek. Heal our land. He goes, stop. Run it back. If my people, 
my people will humble themselves. That's so key right now, guys. He started branding that on my heart about three, four months ago. It's something I've, I've studied Sermon on the Mount. It's been something that's been a, a real uh, heartbeat for me for years and years. And the Lord's bringing re me right back to humility, right back to meekness. And he's just dealing with my, me, my own stuff, all my little internal judgments, all, all my little uh, internal accusations. I mean, he's shortening the leash. I thought he had me on a short leash. He's like, no, 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 buddy. Come on in here. Let's reel you in. Get real short leash. I'll just tell on me for a minute. Uh, the Lord put on, my wife and I put on our heart to, to do something um, for, for some people that we hadn't been serving, in, 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 you know, in the previous years. And, and so we started making some personal changes so we could serve a, a certain group of people. And, um, and I was literally one hour, I'm just confessing. Can, just, just, can we just do confession for a moment? I was one hour into that first time that we were going to serve this new group of people. And in my mind, I didn't say it out of my mouth. In my mind, I'm thinking, so many other people need to be doing this too. Why aren't, why aren't other people serving? I need to get other people in here to really serve. And I'm sitting there one hour into my new, <laughs> you know, expression of a, a, a righteous act, and I'm, I'm in my mind judging others. I'm, I'm one hour in. And the Lord goes, listen to yourself. And I'm sitting there, and I go, oh, I am so judgy. I'm so self-righteous. I'm so full of me. And I started asking the Lord while we were there doing this thing. And I just said, just hollow me out. Just, just dig whatever this is in me. Just dig it out of me. Because there's a dynamic that 2 Chronicles 7, it's, it's a shocking dynamic. If we can really get it right, we realize there's two things there. Verse 13, the Lord literally says, when I send a pestilence. <laughs> when I send a pestilence on the land. When I shut up heaven and there's droughts. When I send locusts. 2020, we literally saw massive locusts, massive droughts on the West Coast, and a massive pestilence on the whole earth. Like we literally saw that. There's no figurative drought, pestilence, and locusts. They were real ones, all of them. I should know. I, some of you um, have survived COVID, and, and God bless you. I got it twice. I got the double portion. That'll, that, that'll overthrow all your CDC doctrine right there. I mean, I got, a, I got an asymptomatic version, then I got the full-blown, every kind of symptom you want version. The Lord says, when I do these things, there is a prescription. My people, hear me, my people, my people, humble yourselves. And I've, I'm, I'm just aware of my own propensity to read these kind of passages and instantly start pointing at other people. They all need to humble themselves. I'm here to teach you guys, humble yourself. We're humble in Atlanta. We've gone low. Are you guys humble in KZU? I mean, because we've gone low in Atlanta. You know what I mean? And I'm so aware of my own propensity to go there. And I'm like, dear God, I, I need God. I need you to fix me right now. My people who are called by my name, that idea that we carry his name, uh, will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, then, then, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. I, like, I'm not coming with some new flashy idea tonight. 
I'm coming to you with this. Beloved, we have to humble ourselves. And if we think we're humble, we need to humble ourselves some more. We need to ask the Lord to judge us right now, to hollow us out, to get rid of whatever the inner issues are, whatever the outer issues are, stuff that we've winked at for a long time, stuff that we've thought, well, that's just, you know, it's just a a challenge I deal with. No, no, no. He wants to deal with your challenge that you deal with. He wants to get you free of that. I had a, um, I had a series of dreams for about two weeks. Uh, honestly, it was when I got COVID, I started dreaming every single night. The second time through, I started getting dream, multiple dreams every night, night visions. And uh, I had this dream, and I'll just tell the quick version of it, but I had this dream, this, this uh, uh, young husband in our church, he was in the dream. He just started telling me about his personal sin issues and how it was affecting his, his uh, marriage just in the dream. And it's stuff I didn't know about. And so when I came out of quarantine, I'm in service. We do an altar call. People are in the altar. And this young man, he answers the altar call right in front of me. And I'm looking at him, and the dream is just playing right back in my mind. And so I, um, I just went over to him, and I just said, hey, I just want to share this with you. I think the Lord wants to deal with your heart. He wants to heal you. And uh, I said, I think this area, this area, this area, stuff I didn't know. And he looked at me like he saw a ghost. And he's like, I go, listen, I'm here to help. If I can help you, I want to pray for you. And, and he's like, can we meet this week? And we got together and we met. He goes, man, everything you said, he goes, that's stuff that I just, I just walk around with. I just thought it was just challenges I'm dealing with. And I said, look, man, we're all under the scalpel right now. God wants to set you free of that stuff. He's working on me in areas. He's working on you in areas. But it's a picture. He's working on all of us, beloved. The reason why, we're going to marry Jesus. We're going to look just like him. And Jesus is humble. He's shockingly humble. I mean, I, when I think about Jesus' humility, it really messes me up. Because, you know, obviously we just came out of Christmas. We just came out of all the incarnation messages. But to think that the one who created everything came as a baby born in a barn and his first bed was an animal food-eating trough. Like, are you kidding me? I mean, he's so humble. He's so meek. Turn over to Matthew chapter 11. Just look at what he says. I've been preaching 31 minutes. Brother, you got to repent of that lying. That's what I'm talking about tonight, right now. (laughs) Getting rid of all that. In our next 14 minutes and 40 seconds, I'm going to look at Jesus. Matthew 11. Again, a passage I'm sure you're familiar with. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me. I'm convinced that So many of us, the the wear and tear on our soul, it's not because of external issues. It's because of the internal issues. And he's going to dial in where the wear and tear is coming from right here. He goes, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. Because you've got traffic on the inside. You're so burdened with so many things. You're, You're wrestling. You're laboring. He goes, I'll give you rest. And here's how it works. He goes, take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. Learn from me. Search the gospels and find every time Jesus says, learn from me. I'll I'll do it for you. You know what happens when you do that search? You find one time right here. Learn from me. I'm gentle 
and lowly in heart. He's saying, become like me. I'm gentle. I'm meek. I'm lowly of heart. And you'll find rest for your souls. I'm convinced all that internal traffic, it's because we don't carry his yoke. It's because we're, we're laboring for self. We're fighting for our own preference. We're fighting for our own way. We're fighting. We don't even know what we're fighting. We're just fighting for our own lusts. I was struck last week. You know, we started Isaiah 57. Isaiah 58, God's chosen fast. I'm sure you know that passage. He goes, this is the fast that I've chosen. And he describes all these different points of it. And he says, in verse 9, actually, I just want to turn over there. I'm sorry. I just yeah, I want to hand you this passage. Isaiah 58. Verse 9. He's going to make a promise. He goes, I'm going to give you answered prayer. I want to give you answered prayer. I go, oh, wow, I want that. He goes, you're going to call and I will answer. I go, yes, Lord, I want this. He goes, then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You will cry and he will say, here I am. I go, yes, yes, yes. He goes, if you take the yoke away from your midst, the oppressive attitude towards others, the oppressive ways towards others, and look at this next phrase, and the pointing of the finger. And we are living in a cultural context right now where the pointing of the finger at everyone else and their problem and what they're doing wrong has become so normative. It's basically the way that we now interact in any kind of public discourse. They're wrong. No, they're wrong. This news channel hits them. That news channel is hitting them. Everybody's pointing the finger. And Christians are jumping on the sides. And the Lord goes, I'm not talking about any of this right now. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about your own heart. He goes, get rid of the pointing of the finger. I go, oh, God. He goes, yeah. The way that the church will get answered prayer, the way that the church will step into an anointing to cry out and see the answers is if she will quit judging and pointing the finger. And this is what I realized about me. I'm just talking about me. When the Lord says, if my people will humble themselves, I realized I already thought I was humble. I'm not even sure I know how to humble. Because I'm pretty sure I'm humble. You're humble. I'm humble. Let's, we're humble. What do you mean, Lord? And I did not even realize the amount of activity that I picked up even in this cultural context that's become so normal. Like that, that, it's like the air is toxic with it. It's become so normal. We've just imbibed it, and then we've embraced it, and then we practice it. And the Lord goes, none of it is like Jesus. All this back and forth wrangling words and accusation and pointing and all this anger in the atmosphere. It's not like my son. And he's going to shake us down until we don't want any more of that, and we just want him. He says, learn from me. I'm meek. I'm lowly of heart. He goes, if you learn from me, you're going to find rest for your souls. We were talking this afternoon, and we were just talking about these points, this these issues of humility and meekness and it, how it's such a requirement right now and it's the necessity for the church. And, and I was sharing about um, some, some men that I've, I, I consider friends that are uh, house church leaders in, in China. They're part of the underground church in China. And, and I want to just share this one story because what I realize about myself is I know, I know what humility looks like, but for me to be humble, there has to be a transformation internally. And I think what the Lord is affording us is the necessary pressure on the church in America 
I think it's going to increase and it's going to enable us to have a context that we can either embolden ourselves in stuff that is going to disintegrate under the pressure or we can actually get low. He's going he's to continue to create the context through challenge and difficulty that's going gonna, gonna to necessitate humility. Well, I, I've had amazing friendships with uh, these different leaders and how many of you have ever heard of The Heavenly Man? You ever read that book, The Heavenly Man? Well, Brother, Brother Yun, he, we've had him uh, in our church eight, eight times. Um, I've had him in my home. Um, I consider him a friend. And uh, the first trip that he ever made to us, um, he brought these two leaders with him. And I didn't know if they were like, you know, like his assistants or, or what they were. I just, they were just, you know, two other Chinese men that, you know, they didn't speak any English. And, and so after we do this service, they're introducing themselves and, um, and their, their interpreter is introducing them. And, um, and she says, well, th- you know, this is uh, Brother Joshua. And, and he says, hello. And, and, and I says, so, so what do you do? And he says, oh, I, I'm a pastor of a very small church. And she goes, he says he's a pastor of a very small church. His church is 4 million people. And then... <laughs> The next guy is, I'm, hi, I'm, I'm Pastor John. I have the smallest church. He, goes, he literally said this to me. He goes, I have the smallest church in China. And he says, she goes, yeah, he says he's got the smallest church in China. She goes, his church is one million. And these men were extremely broken. And uh, so it was a matter of months, and I was able to go and visit them in their environment. And I was with Brother Joshua in his underground Bible school, and uh, I got to see so much of the the work and the ministry they do. And I mean, these guys were force feeding me food like crazy, serving me hand and foot. And Brother Joshua, the pastor over the four million, he was the number one guy taking plates and taking out the garbage. They were throwing food at me, making sure I ate while they didn't eat. And they they were overdoing it. It was just so much, and I was getting offended. They were serving me so much, I started saying, stop, stop. And internally, I realized, oh, my pride won't let them serve me. And Brother Joshua, his testimony is dynamic. He's been prisoned for Jesus. He's been beaten mercilessly. I mean, dynamic experiences in suffering, in glory. I mean, he's just, I mean, I just sit with him and I just ask him question after question after question. And he's always so understated. And those leaders, when I think I want to look at Jesus and look at his humility, and then I think I need a human to look at, I look at those leaders. I think about them. But I'll just share this. As I was leaving That first trip there with Joshua, I was going to the airport, and it was a long walk from the time we got in the car to where I had to go with my bag. And I get out of the car, and the wheel on my bag breaks. And it's like my first trip to China. I've loaded this bag up with, like, everything. Like, I've got, like, a 50-pound bag. And, um, And the wheel breaks, and so I can't pull it. And he comes up to me, and he's gonna wrestle this bag out of my hand. And I'm pulling it, and he comes up, and he starts pulling it, and he's wrestling it. I go, no, no, I have it. He goes, no. And he doesn't speak any English. He goes, no, I'm taking it. Basically, he points it to himself. I go, no, 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 no. <laughs> You're not taking my bag. And I, because I've got to carry it now, because I can't, I can't wheel it. He goes, no. And, and I go, no. <laughs> and he goes, no. <laughs> Real strong. And I go, uh, okay. And he grabs the bag and he's carrying it and, and he's walking in front of me with my bag. And here's a man who's been beaten for Jesus. He's suffered dynamically for Jesus. He will not let me carry my bag. He's a pastor of 4 million people. And I'm walking behind him and I'm, cr- I'm just crying. 
I'm just crying. And I realize I'm, I'm just so ashamed. I'm so embarrassed because I, don't, I can't even receive it. You know what I mean? My own pride won't even allow me to like allow him to serve me. And I wonder, I just, you know, thinking about this story, I wonder what the disciples felt like when Jesus said, I'm going to wash your feet. And Peter's going, no. And Jesus is going, no. <laughs> you know, it's the same kind of transaction. And for a, about a mile, I walked behind him, and it felt like a mile maybe. I don't know if there's a real mile, but it felt long. I'm crying while he's carrying my bag. And, and he drops me off, and we say goodbye. And that was my first time with him. We've been together a half dozen times since. But the Lord spoke to me about it later. He said, son, in my kingdom, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. And the lowest has the most authority. And he said, Joshua was outranking you. He knew his authority, so he went lower than you. And those are the kind of emblems we need right now so we can understand where God is trying to take the church. Because for us in America, we've been so comfortable and so puffed up for so long, we don't even know how intoxicated we are on our own name, our own performance, our own platforms. We don't even know how puffed up on all that stuff we are, on our own privileges. James 4, he goes, where do fights and, and, and conflicts come from among you? He goes, it's your desires that you war for among yourselves. You have lusts on the inside that you're fighting for all the time. And I think about all of our conflict and it's just, James boils it down and he goes, it's y'all trying to get your own way. And we're so used to that in America. And beloved, we're going to look just like Jesus. So he's got to take us from where we are right now to looking just like him, to conformity to Christ. And then the Lord, what he does is he offers it to us. He goes, humble yourself before me. Humble yourself before me. And so that's where we're going to pray into for the next few moments. And um, I believe the Lord really wants to do a transitional work in, in our hearts. Maybe where we didn't think I need more humility, the Lord's going to highlight areas. Or maybe right now you're, you're like where I was and am, where I'm looking at some areas of my own life and I'm like, Lord, I'm sick of this. I don't want to be like this anymore. I want you to change me. I want you to rearrange me. I believe he even wants to meet us with that tonight. Amen? Amen. Let's stand. Simple words. I find some of the most challenging things are some of the most simple things. Thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a broken and contrite spirit to revive the spirit of the contrite to revive the spirit of the humble. Let's just turn our eyes to him right now. Lord, we know you want to release revival. We know you want to make your church just like you. We know none of the challenges of this year have happened apart from your sovereign leadership. Some of it you enacted, some of it you allowed. But you're working on us to make us just like you. So I'm asking even right now that you'd sweep across us the wave of the Holy Spirit. 
the conviction of the Holy Spirit. God, even as you're shortening my own leash, would you just grant us the grace of that right now? Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts. Would you allow Holy Spirit right now just to speak to you about areas that are not like him? Attitudes, internal judgments, preferences. There's at least a half dozen verses in the New Testament that say, prefer others above yourself. Romans 12, 10 has been on me. Be devoted to one another like family. Prefer everyone above yourself. I realize this, we've got a lot of language without a lot of actuality. And he's not, he's not angry with us. He's committed to us. That's the point. He's committed to us. Come Holy Spirit. Would you just let him investigate you right now? Maybe even just say, Lord, I open my heart. I open my heart to you. Show me. Some of you, you already have those places. You already know. He's already shining the light. He's been speaking to you. Some of you right now, he's bringing things to your mind. Come, Holy Spirit. Some of you, you have people that have been cursing you, and the Lord's inviting you to bless them. That's just Christianity. That's, that's not radical. That's just Christianity. But how often have we cursed those who curse us? He's inviting you to do good to those who spitefully use you. Pray for those who hate you, who hate you. I've been so convicted of my own propensity to internally judge those who hate me which is an exact opposite of what he asks. He says, pray for them. Pray for them. Come, Holy Spirit. The word even during worship came out tonight. Areas we need to repent of. Mentalities, mindsets. I feel like the Lord's just teeing the ball up for us. Come, Holy Spirit, would you just allow him right now in a deeper way? Take it deeper, Lord. Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for my propensity to judge. I'm sorry, God. I don't want to be like that. I want to be like you, Jesus. I want to love those who hate me. I don't want to align with anything that's not like you. Forgive me. You have an opinion about everything that's happening. I want your opinion. A prophetic brother, friend of mine, he had an encounter with the Lord, and the Lord told him, the only news you can believe right now is the good news. The only news you can believe right now is the good news. If you've aligned your heart with the, the news, the media, the social media feed, whatever it is, unhook it right now. It's an avenue of deception. It's not giving you heaven's perspective. We do not need another word from the right or the left. We need a word from above right now. Come, Holy Spirit. So if the Lord is, if he is convicting you, if there's areas right now where you're saying, God, I humble myself. I want to humble myself. I want to turn away from that and become like you. I just want you to notify the Lord, either with an uplifted hand or, or come forward or in whatever way you want to respond. We want to respond right now to the Lord. Here I am, God. I turn to you with all of my heart. I'm answering 
if my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. I will heal all the land. If my people, I will heal all the land. Oh. God, forgive me. Forgive me, God. I humble myself before you, Lord. I want to be more like you. I want to put my hand to my mouth and my face to the ground. I want to hear what you have to say and only say what you say. I want to be a son just like Jesus. I only want to do what I see you do and only say what I hear you say. Come, Holy Spirit, even right now. Come, Holy Spirit, even now, more. Even more powerfully now. Could you worship team, could you just take us into a moment of worship?
feet.